Okay. Okay. We ended class, whatever that day was, talking about the idea of. We were talking minimum wage. We looked at different states and different minimum wages, and some of them actually don't have a minimum wage, or a few of them have minimum wage below the federal level. Then we talked about, oh, what are some reasons for raising minimum wage? What are some reasons for not raising the minimum wage? Um, that's where we stop. Um, so the next thing is an efficiency wage that we're going to talk about. This is the idea that we've already danced around this, so I'm going to go through it fast. Anyway, um, the efficiency wage is the idea for a company to kind of do what we talked about in our example the other day when we were talk, talking about an oligopsony. I don't want to be stuck with the worst workers. I want everybody to come to me first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay offer a salary higher than I should. Higher than equilibrium. If McDonald's and Hardee's and Wendy's are all paying everybody seven and a quarter an hour, I'm going to offer eight. So then everybody comes to me first, and then I get to pick and choose, and I get who? The best workers there are, right? And then let the others fight over what's left. So that's the plan. So we call that, it's inefficient because you're paying more than you should, but it's called an efficiency wage because you're paying a higher wage because you're hoping to get extra efficiency because you're getting the better workers. So, a little bit backwards with the name, but that's the plan here. So, the idea is, but it's okay if I pay more because I'm going to get the better workers. And the workers I have are going to work harder because they're going to be saying, I don't want to risk this good paying job. Because if I mess up with this $8 an hour job, what's left for me? It's a seven and a quarter. So I'm not going to be goofing off as much, calling in sick, coming in late as often. I'm not going to be stealing as much stuff. I'm not going to be, I'm actually going to care. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to be more loyal. I'm going to be less likely to talk smack about my boss out in the public. Those are good. And so that, that's what you're going to be getting as far as workers there. You, so overall, it's a nice idea. But there's a problem. And what would that be? It's expensive. True. It is. Uh, it's, it's, you're paying more than you should. But hopefully the payoff will come through this increased productivity and loyalty. So there's the other problem. Is your competition going to let you do that? If you just had the McDonald's, Hardee's, and Wendy's, and McDonald's had all the good workers, is Wendy's going to be happy with nothing but bad workers? No. So what are they going to do? Raise their wages. They can raise their wages too. So you visual learners, this is what we're talking about. You should pay seven and a quarter of efficiency wages higher than that. Don't, don't worry about that. But in reality, okay, I bump those salaries. People can start coming to me first. Well, Wendy should can say, well, bleep that. They're going to raise wages too. McDonald's is going to say, well, bleep that. They're going to raise their wages too. So then guess what? Selling my $8 an hour is a new equilibrium, right? So I'm paying just as well as everybody else. So then I'm going to get a third of the good workers and a third of the worst workers, right? If there's only three employers in town. So what's going to end up happening? I'm either going to have to keep raising my wages, and then they're going to raise theirs, and I raise mine, and they're going to raise theirs, and then somewhere along the line, we're going to, I can't raise, I, I keep paying people $13 an hour to cook hamburgers, so I'm going to stop doing wait, and it's all going to balance out at a new higher wage. Oh, isn't that going to increase the price of those? Oh, yeah. So I'll have to raise the price of my hamburgers and that kind of stuff, which is also going to put pressure on you. Ooh, I don't need as many, more, as many workers, which comes to this. The higher the wage is, the less workers are going to get hired. Because McDonald's, Hardee's, Wendy's, they're all going to be saying, well, it's one thing for me to you know, put up a slacker if I only have to pay seven and a quarter an hour. But if I got to pay Preston $13 an hour, I don't think so. Preston, you voted off the island to try to smoke and all that kind of stuff. Right. Just, that's what happened. So, I guess it's nice. If you are one of the workers that benefits from an employer trying to take advantage of the efficiency wage and you get some pay raises, but. Pallet designed up in Lawrenceville, two pay nine, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I guess, yep, yeah, Food Line is knowing that. Um, but the other employers in town apparently are okay with the level of workers that they're getting. And apparently there's plenty of other workers floating around out there, so they don't really feel like they have to compete for 
the limited pool of available workers. In Blackstone, um, the Lion rates there is 30, and in the right after that, Walmart rates there is 11. Yep. <laughs> okay, so that's that efficiency wage in action because there's not as many, bizarrely enough, available workers, qualified, whatever. So we're like, well, we got to pay more in order to get the workers we need. And Walmart's like, mm, we got to pay more in order to keep Food Lion from stealing our workers. And, and Food Lion apparently says, oh, crap, we can't afford to raise ours anymore. Yeah. So there's but, stuff. There's stuff. So, um, why do different jobs pay different wages? Why does a lawyer get paid a lot more than a janitor? Why does a baseball player home run hitter that hit 60 home runs a season get paid more than a school teacher? He does yeah. more work. It's supply and demand. It's not necessarily doing more work. How much work does a football player do? None. Oh, uh, actually, roll that. Actually, they do a fair amount of work because. Oh, uh, great! Cool. cool. No, I'm not. No, I'm not going to go there because it'll be 20 minutes. But there's a bunch of off-season training and all that kind of stuff and all that stuff that they got to do and all the weightlifting and stuff that they got to do when they're not playing during the week and during the off-season and that kind of stuff. The bad, bad players that aren't going to stay in the league are the ones that are going to be, you know, once we're eliminated from the playoffs, I ain't doing nothing until summer camp in August. Those players don't stay in the league for a short amount of time. But anyway, it sounds like what happened in Pittsburgh. Yes. Um, apparently, it's what happened to Cleveland, too. But, I don't know. but anyway, it's supply and demand for skills in demand. How many people are there out there that can get 60 home runs a season without steroids? <laughs> Not very many. But that's a valuable skill to a baseball team. They'll pay millions of dollars for that. How many people are there that are out there that can consistently kick field goals from 60 plus yards away? Not many people that can do that. They'll pay good money for that. How many people are there that can cook French fries? A lot. Millions. So they don't have to pay a whole lot because they can easily replace a French fry cook with another French fry cook. Right? So that sort of ends up, it's our supply and our demand for these services and the skills that are needed. That's what's going to be sort of. And I'm sorry, I just, I left Barry Bonds' name there, but ultimately, A, we don't really have any big home run hitters that were doing it like Barry was doing it when Barry was doing it, but of course Barry was a little bit juiced up when he was doing it, as we find out, because just like, like 50 years ago, it's like now, and, uh, he's hit 60 some odd home runs a season, now home run leaders are only getting in the early, mid-40s kind of thing, it's, it's, so I'm like, I don't know what the name you put. So, you baseball fans, anybody baseball fans? Okay, who should I put there? Probably Sam or Kevin. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fair. Okay. <laughs> Don't know either of us. There we go. I haven't watched a baseball game in a while. Ever since I last needed a good nap. And part of it is. Some jobs we need to pay more because some jobs are so blankety blank important that we want smart people doing the job. If you need brain surgery, who would you rather have working on your brain? The smartest person out there, or that you graduated last year class in high school? You want somebody smart messing around inside your skull. If you are on trial, being convicted for murder, and you're on trial, who do you want there as your lawyer? The best, sharp, evilest, whatever that you can find, or that do graduate last in class in high school. So, if we want smart people to be doctors, we want smart people to be lawyers, there has to be incentives out there to make smart people decide, well, I'll put up with the crap that i got to put up with for eight years for the medical school and wrote the, not rotation, I'll, the internship and residency, that's work. Uh, and all that kind of junk, and working 36 hours straight, and all that kind of stuff, and dealing with guts and stuff. But you got to make it worth it. Because, as I can say here, if doctors got paid the same as used car salesmen, which job would you rather have? The used car, car sale. Because it ain't like you got to worry about your beeper going off at 2 o'clock in the morning and saying, e -e -e -e, car buying emergency. It ain't a life or death thing. 
You can sleep like a baby at night. So it would kind of suck that you know the smart people. It's like pain the same. The smart ones are going to be the ones that are going to end up being car salesmen, and then who's left to be the doctors? People that were too dumb to be a car salesman. And is that who you? No. So there has to be the incentives in place there. And that comes back to the why you need to have more tools in your toolbox. If you want the people with more tools and toolbox doing the job, you've got to give them the incentive to put those tools in the toolbox. Pay them. Pay has to be there. We've kind of uh, notice how I'm almost going a little bit faster here. But that's okay, because we've gone over a bunch of this ground before. Marginal means what? I just, Come on, you I just remember, I know, but every time I try to think of it, I'm just yeah. Extra. Resource <laughs> is what? <laughs> so, it's stuff that you use. use. Stuff that you use. Extra stuff that you use has a Long cost. Cost. So, if you're going to be doing something like hiring more workers, buying more bulldozers, buying more chainsaws, whatever it is, there's an extra cost to give you extra resource. It costs you to buy another chainsaw, right? So, it costs you to buy another bulldozer. It costs you to hire another worker. And it might cost you more than you might realize. Because, Hiring another chainsaw, the extra cost is what? The cost of the chainsaw. Did I just say hiring a chainsaw? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but to hire a worker might come with a cost more than just the wages of that worker. You hire another person. Why would you, you go from having eight people working for you to having nine people work for you. Why are you hiring that ninth person? Because you need them. Because you plan on selling more, and in order to sell more, you gotta make more, which means I need a or maybe I need another worker. So you kind of need your sexual worker. So, who do we want to hire? Bill. Okay, we're going to hire Bill. Hopefully, it's not Mitchell. What? Hopefully, it's not Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, no, Billy's not the replacement here. We want to add on. Okay. Well, so, we have, okay, two, four, all eight of them. Nine of you, how many of you are here? One, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can't count. I'll say ten if, if, if I'll use a chart. The ten of you are all working. The, okay, the five of you over here, y'all have been working for me for three years, and y'all are making about twelve dollars an hour. These three, five of you over here, have been working for me around a year or so, and are making like eight dollars an hour. What is it, twelve for y'all? Eight for y'all. Uh, no, that's ten for y'all. Okay, ten for y'all, twelve for y'all. Y'all been here for one year, y'all been here for two years. And I hired Billy. I need somebody, I need them now. It's hard for me to find a worker because our economy just picked up and life is pretty good, so I'm stealing Billy from wherever he's already been working or that kind of thing. So I offer Billy seventeen. No, I'm offering ten dollars an hour. Well, let's say I offered ten dollars an hour. He's just starting to increase up. Yes, exactly. I'm paying him ten dollars an hour, and he's been here for one minute. What about the five of y'all that have been here for one year? Y'all are like, beep that. That ain't fair. That sucks. You need to give us pay raises, or dang it, we'll leave. If Sam gets mad and leaves, he gets mad and quits. So then what happened? I went, I went from having 10 workers to having 10 workers, and I went from having one of them being having five years experience to one of them now having no minutes experience. It's all worse off. So I can't tip off my workers, but I have. So I have to do something to make these five not get mad and quit, because they're getting paid the same as this dude that's only been in here for one minute. So I give y'all an hour raise, or a dollar an hour raise, something like that. So the five of y'all, I'll give y'all a dollar an hour raise. And then the rest of y'all are like, well, we've been here a whole lot longer than them, and they're getting a pay raise. Oh, uh, what about me? So I give five people a one dollar an hour raise, and then let's say the rest of y'all, I give y'all, I don't know, 50 cents an hour. Well, yeah, we have anyway. That's all that is. Okay, so that's an extra two dollars and fifty cents an hour I have to pay. 
So guess what? For every hour that Billy is working, it's going to cost me what? $17.50. $10 going into his pocket. The $5, it's $1 each going into Matthew and Connor and Tyler and Sam and Amanda into their pockets. And then the 50 cents each, the K, and I, I'm not going to go there, but it's Yes, right. So, same thing that we had going on when we talked about raising minimum wage. Raise minimum wage from seven and a quarter up to ten dollars an hour means you fifteen dollars an hour workers are also going to get a pay raise. So the question I have to ask, which we'll go into more detail in two hundred two next semester for all of you that are going to be taking it, some of you haven't signed up yet, by the way. Funny. And some of you, I'm an education major, and I don't need one kind of class. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> You did. Good for you. My new favorite students. <laughs> and you, you seem to be doing okay as far as the So, the thing you have to ask yourself is it's going to really cost me $17.50 an hour to have Billy working for me. So, the question is am I going to get $17.50 worth of value out of him working for me? Is he going to make me more than $17.50? Is he going to make me more than $17.50 worth of cake? He can bake me more than seven seventy dollars fifty cents worth of cut down trees or whatever, or sesame chickens or whatever the job is, right? That's the man you have to do. So, and that's why the little thing I'll talk about. We kind of this is a good time for you to get into the job market because there's not that many workers here. So then, guess what? Businesses are having to pay more to bring in new companies, new co new employees. So hopefully, that's going to mean more salary for the rest of us too. Because they also need to do this to keep you from leaving, right? Well, I mean, that's why, well, that's why they're doing it, to keep you from leaving. Whether they hire somebody else or not, they need to be giving you pay raises to keep y'all from leaving for another opportunity. Keep the people like so leaving food line and going to work for Walmart because that's the dollar that they're missing. Yeah, they really are like, right? Yeah, okay. So, y'all with me here? So, so we first half of this chapter we've talked about being employed. Now we're going to talk about being unemployed. So we got to have a couple of definitions to start with. To to be unemployed means you have, who is unemployed? You know, you get fired or almost. But who is unemployed? A worker, right? So we kind of have to start with the definition of who are our workers. Because you have people that don't have a job that are not unemployed because they're not a worker. Like that little two-year-old child that I saw this morning out in the hallway. <laughs> she ain't a worker. She ain't unemployed, right? So, we have the labor force. It's generally, this will be a question on a test in any point when that does. Everybody that's over 16 that is working for pay or is actively looking. That's the labor force. And you're, I'm over 16, so I ain't get anywhere. I can legally work and I don't have to go get a permission slip from my parents, right? I can work and I want to work. That's your workers. And oh, those who can work and want to work, a bunch of them are working. But there's some of them that aren't working and those who are unemployed, right? So, labor force. Over 16, working for pay or actively seeking. We're going to come back to pay, that's important, and actively, that's important. Those are important words there. So, the people not in the labor force are going to be who? Who is not over 16, working for pay or actively seeking? Who is not that? Children are retired. Kids? Retired people. What, what does it mean to retire? So I ain't gonna work anymore. I quit my job, middle fingers in the air, and I ain't gonna, I ain't looking for the next one, right? Yo, know, great grandpa, he's not looking for another job, right? Who else? Um, Who is, okay, um, disabled. Disabled, okay, they're on the list. But stay at home mom, is she working? Yeah. Raising kids and taking care of all of them. She's working, but she ain't getting paid, right? Right. She ain't in the labor force. 
So guess what? Our labor force number, you know, there's a little bit of voodoo there, just like we had some voodoo when it came to our GDP, there's missing stuff. Well, she works getting done, but she ain't getting paid for it. My wife was that way for a while, but then she's getting my paycheck, so I'm the <laughs> one. Uh, you have discouraged people that they're they don't want to quit, but they've given up. I, I would like to have a job, but I've looked everywhere and I've gone everywhere, everybody said no, so what's left? And they've given up. Just like the single person that's like, I kept dating and dating and get, I date, I get shot down, date, get shot down, date, get shot down, so it's true. I guess I'm okay being single. That's the decision here. But, you know, you're young, you still get you, right? And then disabled people, and then the last group, institutionalized. What do I mean there? Prisoners. Hospitals and prisons. Because prisoner can't exactly go growing up and take a job anywhere. Right. Okay, yeah, they make license plates, but and they do technically get paid, but they, they really don't count. They do they what? Make they, they can't they do make license plates. And they actually do get paid for doing that kind of stuff, and they actually do get a little bit of pay more to clean enough garbage inside of the road, but they really they ain't in labor force because so I'm sure they're not making them wage. No, no, it's only like a buck or two a day or something like that. Just pile up for when they can get out. So these people are not over 16, not working for pay, or not actively looking. To be discouraged, I don't have this here. Okay. I'll go back. Um, I, I'm trying to remember. Unemployment is the inability of those people that are over 16 and at working or that don't have a job that are trying to get one. That's unemployed. We've got, what, 320 million people in the United States. Well, of that 320 million, only about 60% of us is in labor force. That's only like 200 million of us. So of that 200 million of us that are over 16, not old enough to retire, and you know, so we're out there working, of that 200 million of us, what percentage of that 200 million don't have a job, right? And right now that number's floating around three and a half, four percent. Surprisingly low. That's all really low. Is that included? No, legal immigrants. If they're legal immigrants, they're part of the labor force. If they, I mean, if they got their work permit, they can, they're counted. If they're illegal immigrants, they're not counted because they're not part of the labor force because they're not supposed to be working. Yeah, but the, they're up to them are working for pay, so like there's some fuzz here, right? But the, look, I, I don't, bring me last slide, let me go. to be discouraged. Sort of the definition of being discouraged, six months. If you've been out of work for more than six months, you when you lose your job, you can go to the Employment Security Commission and say, I lost my job. And they're going to say, okay, well, we'll give you unemployment benefits. We'll give you money. It's about half of what you were making when you were working. We'll give you some money to help you pay your bills, to buy you a little bit of time for you to find the next job. And while you're getting these unemployment checks for six months, we'll keep paying these checks up to six months. So we're giving you money for up to six months to find your next job, but you have to be actively looking so the, how they, you have to apply to at least two places a week and you have to give them documentation that they have a, that you did it and a lot of times the places you apply to you can get them to sign a thing saying yes they applied here that kind of stuff if you don't if you're trying to play those unemployment checks and you're not turning into things saying that you've been filling out applications you're not actively looking and the government said, if you aren't actively looking, then you apparently decided to retire. Unemployment benefits are only for workers. You decided to no longer be a worker. You don't get checks. If you're really that desperate to find a job, I think you would. Yes. Hopefully you would. But there's some people like, well, yeah, yeah there's half a dozen places on there. Face myself. <laughs> uh, but the other thing is the way the government looks at it is, okay, Beginning six months, half a year. If you can't find a job in half a year, apparently you don't really want a job. 
So apparently, you really are retired. You actually seem to quit working. And we're going to cut you off. So it's pretty much, once you unemployment benefits stop coming in, you no longer count it as part of the unemployment rate. So that's sort of, so they can sort of measure that number fairly easy, how many people get the checks. And that's sort of a fairly easy number to end up getting because it's already sort of self-policed. Are you actively looking? And after six months, because they're like, okay, after six months, I mean, seriously, how long would it take you to apply to every place there is around here? You apply to every place locally in the first couple of weeks, and then what do you do? You expand that circle out a little bit more. You expand that circle out a little bit, and it gets to the point of the, well, if you could literally apply everywhere in the area, and everybody told you no, well, somewhere along the line, you need to say, well, there ain't no jobs here. I need to move to where the jobs are. If you live in Dundas and the general store doesn't hire you, you need to move somewhere else. And if you're deciding not to do that, well, you've decided not to do that, and that's your decision. There you go. And the people that get lost here are the people that are like Jack and Jill, and Jack has lost his job, but Jill still has hers, but they can't afford for Jill to quit her job so they can load up and try to sell the house and move to Atlanta. So they both can find a job because they can't afford to not feed the kids for however long during that transition period. Those are the people that are really getting hopes, especially because you know, the population around here it ain't growing. So the demand for housing around here ain't growing, so what kind of price are we going to be able to get for their house? They're probably going to end up losing money on their house, so they can't afford to do that because they sell the house and they still have to make house payments for a house they no longer have anymore because they didn't make enough money on selling house to pay off the loan. And there's some people that are stuck here. There, there are some true victims here, but overall, that's the thinking. Six months, help you out, pay you bills, so you ain't desperate to do well, crap. I gotta go find a job at Burger King immediately because I gotta buy groceries this weekend. That'll buy you some time, so you have to be actively looking. Don't you have to be 18 plus unemployment? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, because there's a time, there, there, I don't know all the rules because I've actually never collected an unemployment check. It's not hard-headed enough that I would do it if I, they fired me today. I'm going to be swinging a hammer tomorrow working for one of the groups that I work with until and meanwhile I'll start looking for my next job. Just because I'm born with work ethic. It just sucks. Oh, anyway, y'all have no idea how much I would look for me in there. Oh, shit. Right. Um, there's something I was going to say with work that happens now. Uh, I don't mind. 18 to oh, oh yeah, I don't know all the rules, but there's rules for how long you'd have to have worked at the job that you already worked at before you can start collecting benefits and that. Now, is over 16 and actively looking. Half of the people in your high school class, your senior class, weren't in labor force. Because yeah, they were over 16, but they weren't looking for a job, right? Loveline wasn't looking for a job when she was 16 because mom and dad were covering all the bills. But what, what the mom and dad were paying for her boyfriend and what, right? Right until the same love child showed up, right? But others, she wasn't looking for jobs. She wasn't part of the labor force. Where some of y'all were like 16 and then your parents said, well, you want to drive a car? Well, you got to put gas in that car. And I, you ain't going to get your gas out of my gas tank with the hose, so get a job, right? So some of you joined the labor force when you were 16, but some of you didn't. You probably half or more people that you went to high school with were not in the labor force. Lucky sucker. There's some of the people when y'all transfer to the Texas or ECU or wherever y'all are going to go when y'all get it. Just don't really use it. But when, when y'all transfer to wherever y'all are going to go, y'all are still going to be in class of people that were, are not and were not, have never been in the labor force. Because, you know, it must be nice that they got some people that are covering their bills while they're in school. Mm -hmm. So, do well here, get a big scholarship, get out of the labor force for a couple of years. Sometimes they still have the same people covering their bills or not. Yes. Yes, that's that's to hope, that's to dream. Yes. Especially if you have the, the willingly pay you to be in college for five, six, seven years, twelve years. But you know, so option number one is to buy a lottery ticket, option number two, marry rich. So the unemployment rate is simply calculated. It is those number of out of work workers divided by the
trying to get ahead of the game, and then that's the ball spirit. It's like, it went forward like five <laughs> times. Is that the question? Okay, so the number of out of work workers divided by the total number of work. So this isn't the number of unemployed divided by the 320 million of us, it's the number of unemployed divided by the 200 million workers. That's the number that you would go there. Uh, Duke, uh, I really should have updated these numbers, but this is 2015 numbers. There, huh? Uh, and, uh, I'll give it a shot. But, um, uh, or not. Oh, okay, we'll run with this. For the United States, as of August 2018, the unemployment rate is 3.9%. In Virginia, it's 3.1%. Blacksburg, 3.3%, a little bit surprising. Bristol, 3.4%. No, so it's right there. Charlottesville is low, 2.9%. Harrisburg, okay. Northern Virginia, 2.6%. Richmond, 3.2%. Ooh, what? I want to keep the same word here. Who's missing? Us. There really is on this list of areas, there really isn't anything so that's really describing our area. I don't know if we're considered part of the Richmond area, which would that kind of stuff. Richmond's going to have low unemployment rate. We're going to kind of have a little bit higher out here. Historically, this south, south side of Virginia, this stretch, going to start the other side of Emporia, if we go and follow the 58 all the way up to Shirley Point, pretty much about all the way across the state, there's not a whole lot going on anymore. Marshville, Daneville used to have stuff going on, but I told you all that story the other day. And so if you want to start a business in this area and you're going to be creating jobs, guess what? There is money to be had to help you start your business. You can get grants and stuff from the government because they're going to recognize what you see here. These are 2015 numbers, so if you just sort of extrapolate everything, if you knock everything down by 2%, what are you going to see? Above average, above average, seriously above average, seriously above average, seriously above average. Oh, my shit, if you really put Pennsylvania County, Henry County on there just to show you. But there is help to be had if you can start a business. If you're like, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to be hiring people. It ain't just for me. There's been a bunch of small business loans, grants, and that kind of stuff that you can try to find in the future. It's really what's going to wait down, though. Yeah, yeah, the numbers are down from the 2015 numbers, but it is this. Not that much. Uh, part of our problem here is the, around here, we haven't really gotten any new businesses. Retail and food service. Yeah, oh, retail and food service, that's pretty much it. We have a few plants building stuff, making stuff around here, but not a whole lot. But. In this area, but, so there's not a whole lot. So there's not as many employers out there to be doing, going out and doing hiring and that kind of thing. Um, so we're not seeing big change, but then our, I think our population shrinking has it, it slowed down. So we're kind of just sort of sitting still, treading water, not really growing. We're just sort of here at the moment. Is that any real exciting to be here, especially if y'all are one of these young people wanting to get a job? But the unemployment rate, just like the GDP calculation, it was wrong. As long as you measure consistently, it's okay. Our unemployment numbers are wrong because there are people that honestly think, well, my unemployment benefits have run out, but darn it, I am still trying to get a job. Just because the government doesn't consider me an unemployed worker anymore, well, I consider me an unemployed worker. So there are people that aren't counted anymore. And we have an interesting amount of that in this area. Part of it is, okay, we had all the, the furniture companies that shut down, the tech that were right here. 
textile, they did the sock company, you probably Jones Apparel, all that been, they, they shut down. People shut down, and you got workers who are like, well, I used to, I was used to making 10, 12, 15 dollars an hour, and I'm a highly, highly trained textile worker, and you want me to, instead of making 15 dollars an hour, you want me to go go to textiles or set that work. I'm a highly trained textile worker. If you bring me in a textile company, I'm there. And these people haven't gotten to the point of, well, dang it, look, doesn't look like it's going to happen. Maybe I either A, come to South Africa Community College, get retrained in something else, or B, I need to be willing to accept seven and a quarter an hour and go to my local McDonald's. Or hopefully yeah. strike artistic gold or something. Or, <laughs> bless you, strike artistic gold, or write the next No, uh, scratch well on the lottery days. So, but you have some people that legitimately they're not counted, but they are still looking for work. You have underemployment. People, um, Kay, she's got a job. She only works five hours a week. She's got a job, right? So she's counted as working five hours a week. That's your sucks, right? But she'd like to work more. But they. She is counted no differently five hours a week than somebody else is working 35 hours a week. Or somebody's working 55 hours a week. Or somebody just got two jobs. A couple of people, you know, they got two jobs and they're being, well, you know. So they're filling a slot where two people could be working when it's just them doing work, but that's just one person working. All right. Underemployed would be the person that's got the PhD in nuclear physics that's cooking french fries at McDonald's. Because they could find a job in, in the physics field and they ended up cooking McDonald's instead. That's a form of underemployment. They're not working to their potential. Either in terms of the quality of the work they're doing or the number of hours they're doing underemployment, they're not working to their full potential, but that ain't getting counted there. You're working more than one hour, well, you're counted. So then guess what? If all of the work, if everybody here goes five dollars, working five hours a week to ten hours a week, we've doubled the amount of work we're doing, right? Unemployment rate doesn't change a bit. So none of that gets captured. The fact that more work is getting done because that's just the way the math is. It's just that. Oh, so as long as you're working, it doesn't yeah. matter. As long as you're working, you're counted. No matter how little or how much you're working, as long as you're working, you're counted. Then you have people who lie. You have people who have a job and lie and say they don't. So they can collect benefits. Or you have people that don't have a job and lie and say that they do so they don't get kicked out of the house. Or whatever is going on there. Oh, no, because you strike a deal. You strike a deal and you like, Okay, who, who's boss could be? Okay. <laughs> Kay works for Jenny. Kay and Jenny, they're just sort of, they're, they're, they're like evil and they got this thing going on outside. And Kay and Jenny is like, Jenny's like, okay, I'm going to put you on books. I'm going to claim that you work for me. And I'll give you a little bit of money. You just get to stay on the watch judge duty all day. But what happens is I'm going to have an employee on my payroll and then I can use to embezzle money off of my payroll. Now I'm going to tell corporate headquarters, Kay is working 40 hours a week, $10 an hour, $400 a week. I'm giving you $100 so you get to sit at home and watch Judge Judy and the other $300 is going into Jamie's pockets. Score. So she's doing that for however long. Kay is being counted as working. Kay ain't working because Jenny is embezzling. But maybe they really get slick about the thing or whatever, or whatever. And so after a while, what ends up happening is Jenny, quote unquote, fires K. So then K can go to the unemployment office and say, I just lost my $400 a week job. Give me $200 unemployment benefits for the next six months. So then she, right? You can play the game. Yeah, it's Jack, but I didn't, and I'm not recommending any of you. <laughs> but I'm um, just, and then if Jane is willing to like do that to her company and all that, kind of, do you really trust her? It's not like highly yeah. illegal. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, and it's illegal too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but I had a little disclaimer. And then underground economy. Are the drug dealers working? Yeah. Yeah. Are the prostitutes working? Yeah. Are they getting paid? Yeah. Are they telling the government? No. No. Right. So they 
takes about two. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, they'll only go for it one time, right? That's why Al Capone ended up going to prison because he didn't tell the government about his income, right? Boom. Okay. So there's a lot of work going on. Did they get reported to the government? But they can make a company saying they can get taxes, so try to arrest them. Oh yeah, so that's that's why you lie and you cheat the system a little bit. You you, you claim that you know, you, yes, I do legitimate business. I, I, I'm running a group, a convenience store, and I'm selling some gasoline, I'm selling some milk, I'm selling some sodas, and I make fifty thousand dollars a year. And I'm not actually the fact that I'm also dealing some crack out the back door of the thing and heroin out the back door of the thing, and that's where I'm making the other two hundred thousand that I make for work. Yeah. Is that action? That's a true story. Places that I used to work for when I was in high school. Nice. Oh, yes. Two hundred thousand. Okay. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but just Close. rough estimate. And oh, I'm, no, I'm not going down any rabbit right hole, but just I, I just, just know what happened. No, I mean, I, crap, I'm not going there. <laughs> Dude, I am not going there. So, as we get more workers, available to work then more work can get done so more work is possible to get done remember that production possibilities curve where we had goods on one side and services on the other it shifts outward like this we can do more work with more workers right store what is this one oh see goods are going on but you can do Microsoft. I'll write a song. You can do more goods, you can do more services, or you can do more of a combination. We have something called the GDP gap that talks about how much work are we actually getting done compared to how much work could we get done if everybody was working. How big is that difference? What do you mean everybody's working? Yeah, if unemployment rate goes down to like zero, which will never happen, because it can't, and we'll come to that in uh, about two slides, because it's always going to be some people out of work. There's something we call the natural rate of unemployment, because there's always teenagers getting fired for incompetence, right? There are always teenagers that are quitting in a fit of anger, right? There's always somebody quitting their job because their spouse is in the military and getting transferred to Texas. Right? There's always some unemployment. But beyond that, if you get rid of that natural day to day stuff happens, unemployment, if all the rest of the other unemployment went down to zero, then we would be getting all the work done that is possible out of the all 200 million of us in the labor force. But what's really happening? We don't have 200 million of us working, we've got 195 million of us working. How much, in terms of dollars, is that difference? How much smaller is our GDP because we have these people out of work? That's what we were looking at a few years ago when our unemployment rate went up to 12%. So that's like 12 is, that's like one eighth of our workforce is out of work. So our economy shrunk by how many trillions of dollars? That's what we're talking about. That would be the GDP gap. So, how can you be unemployed? Well, we just talked about number one, friction. When you rub your hands together, you get heat. That's what friction. Whenever humans are around other humans, friction sometimes happens, right? Tempers fly. Teenagers get mad and quit. Teenagers do, do bad things, get fired, right? Frictional unemployment is going to be that everyday life happens kind of unemployment. Somebody's been transferred to another place, somebody's moving. Business floods because of a hurricane. That's that everyday quitting environment. The next kind is structural. What do you think that is? Like something that has structure? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, and structure, I mean, we're talking foundation here. 
your skeleton is your structure that holds the rest of your body together, right? Keeps all your guts from falling into your feet, right? Structural unemployment is when something structural, something fundamental to the economy changes. This is going to be where typewriter repair people become unneeded because we are using typewriters anymore. We're using computers. Buggy whip makers, that's the one that's in your textbook. Making the whips that you use when you ride a horse and buggy is no one. Gosh! Tell me, right? We don't do that anymore. Some of y'all maybe on Friday night, that's not something. But, the, but we don't use as many of these whips, so the whip makers, our this economy or the industry has changed, so the skills aren't needed. We don't need typewriter repair people anymore. We don't need, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of what kind of what, what the computer languages were that they were programming the Apollo space capsule with because nobody programs with that language anymore. We don't need those people anymore, floppy disks. Oh, but they use floppy disks. Do they yeah, floppy disks well, make sense? Like, don't need them. Yes. Make, yeah, making the drives for floppy disks. We don't need them. So all those people, they needed to learn how to make something else or they're out of work. And in the meantime, you know, a lot of them are going to be out of work retraining. The textile workers in South Side of Virginia. We used to make a bunch of furniture. We used to make a bunch of clothing. What are we not doing anymore? We ain't making furniture and clothing. Are we going to go back to making furniture and clothing anytime soon? Just look like it. So the structure of the economy in South Side has changed. And so we have a bunch of workers that lost their jobs. So what do they need to do? Keep trained into something else so they can do something different. The third kind we have is seasonal unemployment. Like there's people, the yeah, the farmers, the, well, farm hands, the farmer themselves, well, I'm not employed, but the workers on the farm, a lot of them are by done. The people that work at King's Dominion, well, the Halloween thing is over here done until May. Teachers. Teachers. No, take a year round. Teachers, well, well, they get paid year round, but you're on a nine month contract. The teachers are on a nine month contract, and so when that contract for 10 months for public school, I'm on the nine month. 10 month teachers, they're on a 10 month contract, but they don't get unemployment benefits during the summer. They're just, that's part of their contract. Whether they're paid is stretched over 12 or not, it's just the nature of their job thing. They're yeah, still, yeah. Okay. If they get fired, or they, they're told we're not renewing your contract, then yes, they can go. But until somebody, if they, if they don't have paperwork saying the school system's not bringing you back next year, then they're there. And that's why good school systems do contracts with the teachers before the school year ends instead of waiting until July to set up a contract. But Walmart, well, I started to say Toys R Us, but <laughs> yeah. But if Oh, yes, they are coming back. Belonging to somebody that's just taking the name, I uh, think just going nothing but online or something. Just, 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 anyway. What's the point? Exactly. But if Toys R Us still is a thing, you know, what are they about to do? They're about to hire because they're going to do what? They're just yeah. selling for Christmas. You know, what's going to happen to all those workers that they're adding in November, December? They're going to Most of those are going to be gone in January 15th once they're done restocking things and selling out the. I'm going to get some experience. Yeah, hopefully few of them will remain and stick, but a lot of them are going to quit. Uh, in college town, you're going to have that seasonal, you know, the college students aren't there during the summer, so what happens? A lot of the restaurants, the grocery store, lets a bunch of people go. That's okay because a bunch of them quit to go back home during the summer anyway, right? So, but the amount of work getting done changes. So that's within the year, changes in unemployment. And then the fourth one is cyclical unemployment. Anybody want to take a stab? And then when you're done, take a guess of what this is. Cycle. So, what cycle have we talked about this semester? The business cycle. The business cycle. And what is the business cycle? That's when you have the, the expansion or the recession, contraction, that kind of thing. Cyclical like unemployment is the layoffs that are coming from the ups and downs of the economy. This is the, uh, sorry, the unemployment rate's going up, so we're not selling as much, so I gotta let a couple of people go when you're one of them. If things pick up in the next few months, come back and I'll hire you back. Right? 
This is what happened when unemployment went from like 5% up to 12%. That extra was all cyclical because the economy was contracting because of the financial crisis and people were not spending. The people that got fired September 12th or lost their job September 12th, 2001, but then you know through early 2002, that was cyclical because people are sitting at home watching TV and being scared. They weren't spending. Stores and restaurants were letting people go. Oh, had nothing to do with their products, had nothing to do with the skills of the workers. It was just the people didn't want to leave the house. I kind of feel like that's just kind of throwing fuel on the fire. If you want the economy to be good, you want them spending money. If they already aren't spending money and you're firing them, that's, that's leaving them without money to spend on other things. Yes, but how much you work at food line? Okay, you food line. How much are you paycheck? You make a food line, do you spend in food line? Probably. Quite a bit, because yeah. I buy lunch and food line, yeah. so I spend a bit. Um, I'd say per paycheck, I make about 350 per paycheck, so I'd say a good 50 to 75 dollars per paycheck and food line. Plus, okay. I think Plus a lot I buy right. So, you, okay, well, even at that, for every dollar they're paying you, they're only getting 20 cents back. Yeah. They'd be better off to not pay you at all. And it's like, and is it food lines, role, their job, their purpose, their mission to be helping the entire economy? No. But we're here to sell groceries. Yeah. Right. Also, so, I mean, no. Because a business is kind of looking at you, they're going to wait, what, what do I have to do? And unfortunately, they're going to be like, we got to let people go. And they don't like to let people go because. How much time did they spend hiring these people, investing these people, training these people, and all that kind of stuff? And we hired you because we needed you. And hopefully, this is a temporary speed bump, but we're going to need you back when the economy recovers in a few months. But then you go so, what are these last things that a good employer is going to do? Or even bad employers, what are the last things you're going to do is let people go? They're going to cut spending here, they're going to cut back there, they're going to cut doing other stuff. Try not to let people go until they have to. Last pitch ever. It's the last pitch ever. When the college here, when but it, our enrollment has gone down for a few years, and we can cut off everything. Out of state travel ain't happening, but a bunch of other stuff ain't happening. And then finally, it was like after a couple of years, we're down, and we're like, okay, if any of y'all are like close to retiring, let's talk about see if we can't get you to retire early and we ain't gonna replace you. Kind of thing. The one of the last things the college ever wanted to do was let people go because, hey, we lost programs that change. Yeah, we, we, we lost the programs because there weren't enough students to afford to keep the teacher there. But then guess what? We don't have a fire science program. Hi, Andrea. Oh, we don't have a fire science program anymore. If we get rid of the teachers, then we don't have the students won't come, right? So that's one of the last things that you want to do. But you kind of have sometimes you have to do it. My friend was in the middle yeah. of that program and they got rid of it. Oops. Well, <laughs> as far as usually if we eliminate a program, we have to have a plan in place for how the students that are in the pipeline can complete it. And so there would have been something to Yeah, probably travel to another place. Either that or it could have been another like finishing up taking some online classes or something. They would have had something for you by the step one. Okay, see uh, about the recession all out. I mean, why won't the government, you know, like say, print money, give it to the suppliers so they will, you know, lower them? We'll get to that next slide. Okay. Like chapter inflation. That's a monetary policy chapter that we will get to, I promise. Okay. I will. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to say maybe we got a chance because we have to actually got to do some stuff today. So, I already said this before, so I'll say it again so you don't have to break it down again. We, our economy needs to grow at least as fast. Well, I said population, but I'm speaking it slightly. Our economy needs to grow at least as fast as the growth in the labor force, or else we're going to have extra workers out of work. More workers coming in than the number of workers leaving. So we at least have to have that level of growth. The idea of full employment, this is going to be when you have everybody that wants to work working, and not just working five hours a week, but working at least the full forty. But like I said, but you're always going to have teenagers getting fired. You're always going to have teenagers quitting. And guess what? You're always going to have some structural unemployment because because you have to. 
Well, you always can have seasonal because, hey, agriculture, yeah. hey, King's Dominion, Christmas, you always can have a seasonal. But what you want to do for the politicians to say, my goal is full economic, uh, full employment, you want to reduce as much as that's typical, keep the economy from having expansions and contractions, and get, keep from having recessions and depressions, that kind of stuff. Try to avoid structural unemployment. But there's a problem with that one, and what's that? Structural, yeah. Structural is when the economy changes. And you can't really control that because that's just the next big thing, right? Yeah, the word I'm looking for is technology. Yeah. This structural unemployment is coming from technological advances. The computer is technological advance over the typewriter. The car is technological advance over a horse and buggy. Right? Do we want to say, well, we want to keep our workers working, so screw technology, we're not going to invent anything else? No. The new technology comes along, we're not going to embrace it? No, we can't do that. As a society, we've always got to be marching forward, looking for newer, better, faster, better way to otherwise get ahead and say, and go back to running your own farm somewhere, and there you go. So, you're never really going to do it, but you can try to reduce it. So, maybe what we're going to do is find things that we think are important, but the people that think they're important, we're going to try to keep these businesses afloat anyway, even though they're not needed, that ain't very efficient, right? Remember, there's two economic goals for the class, and I'm talking about how they kind of butt heads. There you go. So, there's always, in the long run, a natural rate of unemployment, and it has been seen to be around 4.5%. 4, 4.5%. There's always going to be frictional, and there's always going to be some seasonal. And, well, there is the march of structural. The structural, it ain't smooth. Seasonal? It's predictable. We know when Christmas is. We know when holiday shopping season. We know when summer is. We know when back to school is. We know when it's harvest time for corn and soybeans. We know those. Frictional, it happens all the time. The structural, that comes to the, in bits and starts, what's the next big thing? When is the next thing that's going to make a whole bunch of people obsolete? When are we going to have battery technology that's going to mean that GMS shut down all of their production plants that can guess power cars because now we can make a real serious battery power car? Any serious, yeah. I can't, I can't get a battery power car and drive to work and back home. We're not serious with our battery power cars yet. We've got to replace lithium ion batteries with the next chapter. That's where you invest your money in the stock market. But I already hinted at some of these. The human costs of being unemployed. First is, uh, duh, I lost my money. I can't pay my bills. So crap, I gotta turn on my cell phone. I gotta turn off direct TV. Ooh, no more NFL Sunday TV. Oh. The direct TV is very much a broadcasting. But you gotta, over time, okay, I gotta get rid of the direct TV. I gotta get rid of this inter home internet connection, get rid of the cell phone. Then got to start using departments for toilet paper, needing departments for peanut butter. Got to sell the house, live in the little apartment somewhere, move out of that apartment into a little apartment, move back home into my parents' basement. How far back does that go? When you, especially, okay, and after six months, I'm no longer getting checks from the government, right? And that can have a profound social, psychological, and physical impact on person. It ain't easy to be unemployed at all. And I ain't just talking about the money. But is there, think about these people that are unemployed and collecting the unemployment checks. What are they doing? Twice a week, at least, they're going and applying somewhere. And they keep getting rejected. And they keep getting rejected. So what's happening? Every week, at least two people are saying, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. How many times does somebody have to tell you, you're not good enough, before you start to believe it? Not too many. Not too many. But then it's still over and over and over. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. Because that's the message they're saying when they're telling you, well, we're going in a different direction. We're not hiring right now. It's not you. It's me. What are they telling you? It's you're not good enough. Basically, they're breaking up with you before you start dating, right? 
You're not good enough. You're not good enough. And that's going to hurt. So once you start thinking, I'm not good enough, and then plus, the, I don't have the money, so my friends are going to King's Dominion, my friends are going to concerts, my friends are going somewhere, I'm staying home. So suddenly my friends are talking about all the things that they're doing that I'm not part of the conversation, I'm sort of standing there. And so you find yourself sort of drifting out of the social groups that you hang out with and that kind of thing. So you're slowly losing your friends, and your friends are sort of a little bit like, well, you know, they you know, dig down and depressed all the time. Well, that's because they were being told they're not good enough over and over and over again. And it's like, so suddenly you're not that fun to hang out with, so you end up losing your friends and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then when you roll in the financial impact of it to where you lose your house, you lose your car, you lose your kids, and you live in any bridge somewhere, and you haven't had a shower in the last three weeks. Right? Shit. Being unemployed, it ain't a curse, but it is a terrible... It is a curse. <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible thing to happen, but it, it, it's not the... They, they didn't ask for it in most cases. But that's why you got to do something to spin things around. One of the little things, when I talk about uh, for collecting unemployment benefits, I see you for actively looking. One of the things as far as actively looking, there's a phrase, and they actually use it when you're talking about welfare benefits, is employment-related activities. One of the things that you do, maybe you're not applying week after week after week, two places, place, place, place. Maybe you come to South Africa Community College working on taking, getting a major degree training itself as an employment related community. Maybe you volunteering somewhere, working in a homeless shelter because, you know, for, but for the grace of God, you would be in there yourself, right? But volunteering will keep you social, keep you active, keep you from getting rejected, give you some kind of meaning and purpose in your life other than just buying into the, wallowing into the depression of, oh, I'm not good enough. And it's and it looks good on a resume and keeps your skills sharp because, oh, by the way, you've been out of work for six months, your skills are six months behind, you know, we've got a whole new version of Windows 10 and you don't know how to use it. And Microsoft Office upgraded in the last six months and you don't know how to use it, so it's, uh, maybe we'll go in another direction. All right. So if you do lose your job, you need to do something, anything, to keep your skills, keep your spirits, keep everything flowing instead of sitting at home while there ain't depression. Washington Judge Judy. She, you know, she's got enough money already. She doesn't need to worry. I'm just saying. It's horrifying how much money that woman has. We have something, and we see around here in South Sacramento, the skills gap. The gap between the skills the employers want and the skills the workers have. Microsoft set up their data center in Boyton, and everybody's like, okay, well, they'll hire a bunch of people. And they're sitting there looking around, and they're like, these are the qualifications we need. How many workers are there out there that we can hire around here to have these? Not enough. So Microsoft is having to bring people in from other parts of the country and make them move to Boyton. Because they're getting good deals on land. Taxes, electricity, that kind of stuff. And they're like, well, we got to have the data center somewhere. And they'll be, yes, some of our employees are going to say, well, gee, it sure sucks to be out there and working in the middle of the woods somewhere. So half of the employees that work at Microsoft live near Raleigh, live near Richmond, and they have an hour for you to get to work because they're used to living somewhere where there was culture for them. Life. Yeah, so there was culture other than whatever mold is growing in the floorboard or somebody pick up a truck, right? There was some culture, right? Arts, museum, concerts, whatever, whatever. Right. So and that's why it's like and that's why it's not going. They want workers and they can, nothing will make Microsoft happier. They can find workers in this area for working at data center there. I told y'all how we were there and Kelly LaCrae. The computer teacher, we're sitting here talking to the head of the bill at the whole place, and she got to talk about a couple certifications she had, and he looked at her right across the table like, Do you want a job? And that's right there in front of her boss, our dean, and his boss. <laughs> and he offered her a job right there in front of both of them. They want workers. And so if you're sitting there and you're like, I don't have a clue what I want to do with major in IT. Major in IT. And to a certain extent, show some progress in that direction because they're like, well, if you're the right person, we'll train you. 
they want to hire local people so they're not taking off their other people and have to make a move from Red Redmond down here and have to pay more and move off to pay the expenses to make a move and then they're like stuck out here in the woods for a year or two and then they get transferred back and then they gotta sell their house on and doesn't make the workers they have in other parts of the country happy when they have to move here. Make Microsoft happy, make yourself happy, get an IT degree. The day that the college realizes just how dumb I am and they fire me, I'm swinging by that day and send her on my way home. Uh, that, that, that's, that's my number one qualified position for a while. What's an IT degree? Uh, no, I mean, you can start with a two year degree, and the, like I said, they'll, they'll teach you the specific for whatever. I was about to say, yes. Yeah. yeah. They'll do some wish for reimbursement for you to come here and take more classes and stuff while you're working. And you take night classes and they'll pay you. And they do much classes and stuff and stuff there in their center. So you can go to work and go to school and work. That's what my dad had to do for his job at a DLA in Richmond. Was, um, they, they were like, yeah, we'd like this to be um, qualified. Yeah, now we'd like to have courses in school. Yeah. Um, when I took those history or history classes, so I could teach history here at the top of my pay graph. Of it. And then I got my credit count up, so I got promoted, so then I get a big paycheck. I had a buddy who um, had an agreement with one of the elementary schools that he volunteered at to get his hours. Mm -hmm. um, they paid for his entire schooling, and he came and worked there 10 years first. Yeah. Um, 10 years. There is, there, there's better deals now. There's going to be some. Tobacco Commission scholarships, they're going to, the word's going to come around in about February, March. Pretty much, if you agree, because one of the other things we had at local, we lost our textile companies, we lost our furniture companies, the other thing we lost is tobacco. Because the tobacco farmers, they used to have a good deal there with their um, allotments and that kind of stuff, but the allotments went away because of lawsuits, because hey, did you know this smoking tobacco actually will like kill you? <laughs> Bless you. People didn't get it. And so, so they lawsuits and stuff. So the states sued the tobacco companies to get back the money that the states state spent on health care coverage for people. They got sick because of smoking cigarettes because they didn't know the smoking pill. Okay, so they have that extra money, and part of what they that money is earmarked for is to help the people in this area that used to grow tobacco that ain't growing tobacco anymore. So it's a tobacco commission, and they do scholarships. And if you say, I'm going to go to wherever, okay, UVA, whoever, and I'll come back to South Side, somewhere in the tobacco region, and I'll work for a couple of years, they'll pay a nice chunk of your tuition when you go off to wherever you go off to. So when those scholarships come around, I'll be talking about when that paperwork comes back around again. But, but you got to be like, jump into that or stuff. No, had nothing to do with tobacco. It's just <laughs> tobacco is where the money came from. Because of tobacco, because of the, it's called the Tobacco Commission because they got the money from the tobacco lawsuits or whatever, and they spread it up. So you, IT, chainsaw juggling, whatever it is. I mean, just, I mean, I guess the chainsaw juggling, you have a little bit of a stretch to fall. But, yeah, it, it ain't agriculture only, it ain't forestry only, it ain't tobacco only, it's uh, just about anything. If it's going to benefit Southside Virginia, okay, so you're going to go to college, you're going to get an education, and then you're going to come back here, that's going to be a benefit to the area. So if you come back here and benefit this area with your extra knowledge and skills and stuff that you can bring back for at least a couple of years, they'll pay for it. Check it out. Um, if I think about it, if I do think about it, I'll try to find a link to like last year's page for any information about it. And Link might be sent year after year after year. So, or you can Google Tobacco Commission Scholarship and find it. Or I'll say like maybe 1890 Tobacco Commission. There's like a page. But Google it, see what it's got to say. Okay. I know we've only got five minutes, six minutes left, five and a half minutes left, but we're fine. We're going to start on inflation. In some e context books, Inflation and unemployment are in the same chapter. And that's why I'm rolling because inflation and unemployment are very close together. They're more than just kissing cousins. Talking about West Virginia cousins. 
Which do you find your sister? Yeah. Oh, anyway, I'm sorry. Okay. I love West Virginia. It's wild and wonderful. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Burn your couches when they win a the football game. Okay. So, uh, oh my. That's what they do. They win a big football game and drag your couches out to the curb and set them on fire. West Virginia University. <laughs> Pepsi's a dollar. I'm drinking Pepsi. 
I mean, no, Coke is a dollar. Okay. Good ticker. Coke is a dollar. <laughs> Pepsi's a dollar. I'm drinking Coke. If Coke goes up to a dollar and a quarter, Coke is more expensive than Pepsi. I'm drinking Pepsi. But what if Coke stayed a dollar? Pepsi drops to 75 cents. Relatively speaking, what happened? Coke didn't change, right? But Coke is still now more expensive than Pepsi, so what am I doing? I'm drinking Pepsi, right? So it's good. The price of one product goes up, or the price of another one goes down. Either way, it's going to change that relationship between those two products, and that's what changes our thinking on what we choose to buy. That's our decision making. If you go to the machine down there at the end of the hallway and you expect to see that the plain MMs both be the same price, but one of them is a different price, you got to stop and think for a few seconds. If one of them raised the price, you got to think, do I like it that much more than the other one? If one of them lowered the price, you got to think, do I like that one much, that much more than the other one? Your decision making changes. And we'll talk more about that next time. Tuesday. So drive safe and have fun, and I hope I can get the court. So that's the thing, right?